Well, in response to so many questions that we've received in recent times, we thought it would be useful to try to put together a basic primer on prophecy. Many people for the first time in their lives are asking serious questions. Where in the Bible does it say this or that? And what's coming? Are we in the end times? And what about America? And so forth. Very basic questions. And so we thought it would be useful to try to cover these materials from a ground floor, from scratch. Without, and we'll try not to jump into too much Bibleese or jargon that tends to puncture our conversation so frequently. We're going to do this in four sessions. This first session, of course, is the introduction. And we're going to deal with two issues. We're going to try to talk about pr the nature of prophecy. What are we dealing with when we talk prophecy? And secondly, how sure can we be? Aren't there theories and ideas like this throughout the ages? D hasn't everyone always felt that they were approaching the end times? Where do we come off being so certain that we're approaching an important period of time? So that's the first session. The first thing we're going to talk about is the nature of time. We take time for granted. We, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it all goes back to some basic fundamentals that most of us may not have thought much about. Let me take you back to high school ge uh, geometry or trigonometry. If we have a triangle and we add up the angles in that triangle, it adds up to how much? 180 degrees, right on. And no matter what kind of a triangle we draft, if we add up the angles, it always adds up to 180 degrees. How many of you learned that rule in school? Sure, okay. Well, suppose we go out together in a large field nearby with a transit, and we lay out a very large triangle, and we add up the angles of that triangle, and it adds up to more than 180 degrees. What would you conclude? That Chuck screwed up again, huh? No, what we've encountered is the curvature of the Earth. You see, this little rule that we all learned in school is only true for a universe of two dimensions. That's why it's called plane trigonometry or plane geometry. And if you have more than 180 degrees, it implies that you've encountered a <coughs> convex curvature. In fact, if you take a course in spherical navigation, or uh, in navigation, you'll include in that course some spherical trigonometry in which you can have a triangle with 90 degrees in each corner because it's, it's in a third dimension. Now, if you have a triangle with less than 180 degrees, you're in a hyperbolic paraboloid, but I don't think that's ever concerned any of us here, so I'll just move on, but I throw that in for those of you that are mathematically oriented. This is the kind of insight that caused Dr. Albert Einstein, as he was grappling with the nature of space and time itself, to come up with a special theory of relativity in 1905, in which he realized that length, mass, and velocity, and time are relative to the observers measuring them. But he generalized that in 1915 to the general theory of relativity. And what's important about that to us here is that it resolves the fact that there is no distinction between time and space. In fact, a physicist will always speak of space-time. You and I speak of space and time separately. But uh, the general theory of relativity ties them together. In fact, Einstein recognized that we live in not three, but four dimensions. And this is no longer just a theory. It's been confirmed over 14 ways to better than 19 decimals. It's today a basic uh, insight of science. One of the things we want to understand is that time can change. Let me give you an example. It's a very graphic example. There are atomic clocks. These are clocks that are extremely precise. There's an atomic clock located at the National Institute of, Tech of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado. There's an identical clock, virtually identical clock, at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England. And these devices are accurate to better than one second in a million years. In fact, the recent one in, in, uh, installed in Boulder is accurate to better than one second in 20 million years. And these are all based on uh, the natural resonance of the cesium atom, which can be exploited to render incredibly precise time standards. But the reason I bring this up is the one in Boulder at NIST, it ticks five microseconds per year faster than an identical clock at Greenwich. Which one is correct? They both are. 
These are extremely precise clocks, and yet they differ five millionths of a second per year. Why? Because the one at Boulder, Colorado is at 5,400 feet above sea level, and the one at Greenwich, England is only 80 feet above sea level. You see, if you take an atomic clock and raise it by one meter, it speeds up by one part in 10 to the 16th. Not enough to change your personal schedules, but it's, it's predictable and measurable. Time changes with a difference in gravity, among other things. Now, there are other demonstrations. They actually took atomic clocks like this and put it on an airplane going around the world eastward. And it lost 0.059 microseconds compared to one at rest at the observatory. They sent one around the world westward, and it gained 0.273 microseconds. And I won't go through the reasons. By the time you account for all the motions and differences, that's exactly what the theory has predicted. And that's exactly what was measured. But perhaps the most provocative example, which you'll read about if you study a textbook in this area, is the example that's usually cited of two hypothetical astronauts. These are two imaginary astronauts that are born at the same instant. And we're going to send one of them to the nearest star. Now, if we look at the night sky, the stars all look different brightnesses, but they're all actually at different distances. But the one that's closest to the Earth is a star called Alpha Centauri. It's the third brightest in the heavens. And uh, from the Earth to Alpha Centauri is about four and a half light years distance. In astronomy, we measure distances by the, amount, the, the distance that light will travel in a year. And uh, Alpha Centauri is essentially 4.5 light years away from the Earth. Now, if we send our theoretical astronaut to Alpha Centauri and back at half the speed of light, let's assume we could do that, then it would take him nine years to get there and nine years back. You follow me so far? The question is, that's Earth time, where we are. What does his clock read as he makes this trip? Well, that's calculated by what's called the Lorentz transformations. And the time in the spaceship is, uh, it, uh, will be in these 18 years on the Earth. His clock will only read 15 years, and, uh, 15 years and 7 months. In other words, he will be more than 2 years and 5 months younger than his twin brother. Now, if that doesn't bother you, you weren't listening carefully. Okay? <laughs> See, time for him is different than time for us on the Earth because by nature of his velocity and so forth. To dramatize this, let me indulge in the fiction that we could send him at 99.99% of the speed of light. I'm not suggesting we could do that. There's some other problems, but let's assume we could. If we, and that would take then nine years for him to make the round trip on our calendar. But on, on his clock, it would be only 33 days. You see, it's, it's, his time is different than ours. I think it was Dr. Gerald Schroeder, who is a, a world-class nuclear physicist, participated in six of the atomic bomb blasts. He makes his headquarters in Jerusalem. He's a good friend. He's the one that's pointed out in some of his writings that if you take the expansion of the, or of the universe as roughly 10 to the 12th, and you take the age of the universe, it appears to be about 15 billion years old, but that's at the fringe of the universe. If you measure that in Earth time, it would be, guess what, six days. Same expansion factor. But let's move on. The key point for us tonight is to recognize that time is not uniform. Time is a physical property. That's what these changes uh, uh, teach us. See, time itself varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity, among other things. You and I exist in more than three dimensions. In fact, we actually, apparently, exist in about ten dimensions. Now, back in 1854, in June of 1854, George Riemann gave the most important scientific lecture that's ever been given, where he introduced the concept of metrics tensors. That provided the mathematics, which then 60 years later resulted in Einstein's general theory of relativity, because it was Riemann that provided the mathematics for it. And uh, Einstein applied that, recognizing we have four-dimensional space-time, more than three dimensions. Uh, that's what we call a hyperspace. A hyperspace is any space within more than three dimensions. And he, Einstein went to his death frustrated because he didn't have the insight to go another dimension. It took Kaluza and Klein back in 1953 to recognize by adding some more dimensions they could resolve light and supergravity issues. It was in 1963 that Yang Mills, the two of them, developed uh, fields that explain electromagnetic and both the nuclear forces, the weak and the strong nuclear forces. The point is, as scientists began to realize that there are more dimensions involved than we're generally aware of, it started to resolve the classic dilemmas in physics. Even 
as recently as 1984 and following, scientists are now speculating that we actually live, for mathematical reasons, in a 10 dimensional. They speak of super strings and so forth, and that we live in 10 dimensions. I mention this because I think it's really interesting to discover that 800 years ago, in the, in the 12th century, we had Nachmanides, who was a Hebrew sage, in his study of Genesis chapter 1, came to the conclusion that the, the reality consists of 10 dimensions. Four are directly knowable, and six are not knowable in his terms. What makes that interesting is this ancient Hebrew sage, studying Genesis 1, came to the same conclusions that our particle physicists today have concluded in the, uh, that we live in 10 dimensions. Four are directly measurable, three spatial dimensions, length, width, and height, and time. Six of them are curled, to use mathematical terms, are curled in less than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, and therefore they're just inferable by indirect means. Now, this whole idea of the 10-dimensional universe is suggestive because the original creation, of course, is described in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. But we have sin introduced, and we have the curse pronounced. And some speculate that that's when the creation was fractured. That we, we are left with four dimensions we can directly sense, length, width, height, and time, three spatial dimensions in time, and six hyperdimensions. We call these four dimensions that we can sense the physical dimensions. And the ones that may be hyperdimensional may embrace what we generally defer by calling the spiritual dimensions. But there is a reality larger than our physical dimensions. We now know that. But that's what we're going to start moving into as we start talking about prophecy. See, the other misconceptions, the part we want to do when we get into this kind of a subject is to set aside baggage, misconceptions, presumptions that are inaccurate, that we all have. Most of us assume that time is linear. We assume that yesterday, uh, tomorrow will be like yesterday, next week like last week, next month like last week. We think that time is linear, uh, intrinsically. And when we were in school, the teacher put a line on the blackboard from left to right. The left end would be the beginning of something, the birth of the famous person or the founding of an empire or what have you. The right end of the line might be the end of that person or the empire or what have you. How many of you made timelines in school? Can I see a show of hands? Sure, we all have. And so because of that, we jump to some conclusions. Incidentally, this dimension we call time is a strange dimension because we can only move in one direction. You see, we can only move forward and we can look back. What we can't do is move back and look forward. Whenever I often, uh, in an audience like this, I'll ask, how many of you remember tomorrow? <laughs> when, I, 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 when I give that talk in California, I hesitate, because I'm sure I'll get a hand or two, but anyway. <laughs> See, we, can move, we move forward in time, and we can look back in terms of history. But we can't move back. It's a popular theme in fictional literature to go back in time. It's, 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 a, it's a very colorful, uh, uh, instrument of, of writers, but it leads to paradoxes, because if you can go back in time, you could kill your grandfather, and then you know, that starts to lead to some problems. So, and you can play around with those ideas, it's just mind stretchers, but the idea of moving back in time is, is generally rejected by most serious thinkers. But the other side, of what, this is what we're going to try to do. We're going to indulge in the opportunity to look forward. But I want to show you why that would require a supernatural insight, and that's exactly the point we're going to make. And so, there's another concept we need to set aside, and that's the concept of eternity. Because we think of time as linear, when we encounter the concept in church or wherever of eternity, we tend to assume that that's like a line that starts at infinity on the left and goes to infinity on the right. We tend to visualize God as someone who has lots of time. That's very poetic. It's very colorful. It shows up in our hymns, in Amazing Grace, what is the fourth stanza, when we've been there 10,000 years and so forth. We tend to imagine eternity as simply having lots of time. That's fine, but it happens to be, the idea that God is somebody that has lots of time is very poetic, but it's bad physics. What do I mean by that? Is God subject to the restrictions of mass? Hardly. Or acceleration? Or gravity? Of course not. God is not someone with lots of time. He is outside the restrictions of time itself. And this uniqueness of God is his personal imprint. It's like his signature. It's an attribute that he exploits to authenticate his messages. 
That's what Isaiah alludes to in Isaiah 57, verse 15. He says, but thus saith the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Now, since God has the technology to create us in the first place, he certainly has the means to get a message to us, obviously. The trick is, how does he authenticate his message? How does he let us know that the message is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or a fraud of some kind? Well, one of the ways he can do that is by relying on an attribute that's uniquely his to authenticate his message. That's what Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 46. He says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. There are dozens of verses like the scripture, but they all point to the fact that God says, I alone know the end from the beginning. God is very jealous of that prerogative. That's why seeking a horoscope or trying to indulge in some occultic medium to learn the future is considered an offense against our creator because he preserves that prerogative for himself. Now, let's talk a little bit about the geometry of eternity. We've represented here as a line drawn on a blackboard. Let's take that line and put it in three dimensions. As we look back, we call that the past. We're in the present. Ahead of us is the future. For us, life is a sequence of events. There are events that have passed, they're behind us, there are events forthcoming that are ahead of us. For us, it's like a parade. It's very analogous in a sense. Like someone sitting on the curb watching a parade come around the corner. For that person on the curb that's sitting there, we see the the bands, the marching units, the floats, whatever, come one at a time and passes. Life is like a passing parade. But you see, for someone who is outside the plane of that existence, say, inhabiting eternity, they're no longer restricted to that sequence of events. They can see the end from the beginning. For God, the past, the present, the future are simultaneous. God often speaks prophetically as if it's already happened, because as far as he's concerned, it has. He's outside our time domain. The analogy, it's a little clumsy, but the analogy that's often used, it's like you're in a helicopter above the parade. For you, outside the plane of that parade's existence, you can see the beginning and the end simultaneously. It's a crude example, but it's, it's perhaps graphic. That's the analogy we're talking about. My favorite, <clears throat> my favorite quote of Dr. Albert Einstein, it says, people like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between the past, the present, and the future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. You see, this past, present, and future thing is the only thing we know because we're within the time dimension. Now, we've made some strategic discoveries, and our entire ministry is based on the uniqueness of these discoveries. The first point is this book that we, this collection of books we call the Bible, is actually consists of 66 different books that were assembled over the better part of 2,000 years and penned by 40 some odd writers. So we have 66 books written over thousands of years by 40 different guys who didn't even know each other. And yet, as we examine these 66 books, we make some critical discoveries that we have in our possession an integrated message system. 66 separate books penned by 40 different individuals over thousands of years, and yet we discover that every detail is anticipated by deliberate, skillful design. I don't simply mean that there's a theme in the Old Testament fulfilled in the New. Much more than that. We discover that every detail, every number, every place name, even the structure hidden underneath the text evidences a master plan, a master design, a design that vastly goes beyond the knowledge of any of its contributors because it anticipates things thousands of years in advance that they had no way of knowing. And that's the fingerprint of the real author, God himself. And this demonstrates that the origin of these 66 books came from outside our time domain. That's what we're dealing with when we talk about prophecy. It isn't just a curiosity. It's a demonstration that God is real, that he cares, and that he has chosen to reveal to us in advance what he's all about, what his plan is for the world and for you and I personally. It's all there. One integrated design. The New Testament 
is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. The Old Testament closes with unfulfilled yearnings, unfulfilled prophecies, incompleted promises. And the New Testament completes it. It all ties it together. Jesus really gave us a guiding principle that's often overlooked. He, Jesus said, think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the law and the prophets. I come not to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now that yacht and tittle phrase may sound strange to our ears because it's a Hebrew term. A yacht is one of the 22 Hebrew letters that you and I would mistake for an apostrophe. It's the smallest little letter. It's almost like a little spot on the paper, a yacht. A tittle is the little decorative hook on some of the letters. Now realize what Jesus is saying. He says that not one yacht or one tittle shall pass till all be fulfilled. That's sort of like you and I saying, like the crossing of the T or the dotting of an I. This is Jesus himself underscoring that we are to take the word of God seriously. And this is important for us to understand because many of these prophecies will slip away from us unless we look at what they say and realize God means what he says and says what he means. In the 40 years that I've studied the Bible and done tapes and, and lessons around in, in various places, I've taught it for probably 30 years, there are many times I go back in my notes or my back my old tapes and I realize some of my positions had to be changed. But they've always been changed in the direction of taking it more literally. Every place I've gone back and realized that I didn't really fully appreciate a certain passage properly. It's because even as literally as I was trying to take it, I didn't take it literally enough. So you did, not that that's correct. I'm just telling you where my bias is coming from as we go. Recognize we're going, to take, we're going to take the word of God very seriously. Now the prophetic scriptures, by at least one reckoning, have over 8,000 predictive verses. According to J. Siddle Baxter, 8,362 predictive verses in containing 1,817 predictions on over 700 different matters. That's from J. Barton Payne's Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy. Different scholars might categorize them slightly differently. This is just one perspective, and obviously we're going to go through these 8,362 predictive verses in the session. <laughs> no, relax. I'm kidding, of course. I'm being facetious. No, what we're really going to try to do is take the broad sweep and try to understand what they say collectively. And... Uh, the first thing we want to do as we go here, as we start going down this path, is we want to measure as we go our confidence. One of the questions that we decided to set out right up front before we get into some of the other issues is how sure can we be that this really is the Word of God? And saying the same thing another way, how sure can we be that Jesus Christ really was who he said he was? Or I should say is who he said he is, be more precise. How sure can we be? Now, as a springboard, we're going to take a look at Peter. Peter's second letter happens to allude that he was an eyewitness of some of the most fantastic events in the gospel period. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Peter says, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitness of his, eyewitnesses of his majesty. All Peter's saying here, we're telling you what we saw. We were eyewitnesses. A few verses later, he says, in verse 19, he says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. I want to look at the strange phrase that Peter uses. Peter was an eyewitness. Uh, he was making a specific allusion to the transfiguration when they were up there and they saw Jesus glorified. He was an eyewitness. You say, what could be more certain than that? Peter himself says he has something even more certain than that. More certain than being an eyewitness present at that time. And that's what he calls the more sure word of prophecy. What is he talking about? We're going to first take a look at prophecy, not in the sense of, gee, what's going to happen next week or next month or next year. Let's take a look at prophecies that were spelled out and came true to prove to us that God really is who he said he 
is. Lord, uh, William Thompson, who later was known as Lord Kelvin, one of the great men of science, is famous for pointing out that until we measure a thing, we really know very little about it. It's one thing to point out to a little verse here, and notice how it's fulfilled there, and so forth. That's fine. But let's see if we can do that in a way that's a little more quantitative, a little more systematic. And uh, the Old Testament, what the Jews would call the Tanakh, we're going to talk about prophecies in the Old Testament. Because there's a fact about the Old Testament you can verify for yourself with any competent encyclopedia. The Hebrew scriptures that we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh to the Jew, were translated into Greek by 270 B.C. It started about 285 B.C. when Ptolemy Philadelphus II funded 70 scholars to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. Why is that so important? Because it's a matter of history. We have copies of that work product, and they were around three centuries before the gospel period. That's a matter of secular record. So for the moment, we can set aside who wrote what book, did Daniel really write Daniel, all of that. It was in black and white, in tangible form, three centuries before Jesus was preaching and so forth. Now, these scriptures contain over 300 prophecies detailing the coming Messiah. Over 300 prophecies that were fulfilled back in the first century uh, A.D. So what we're going to do is, uh, by the way, let me give you some samples of these. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to go 300, relax. But I'm just going to list the ones that are quoted in the New Testament as being fulfilled. Jesus was to be of David's family. You'll find that in 2 Samuel, all through the Psalms, all through Isaiah. He would be born of a virgin that was hinted at in the Garden of Eden. And it's also confirmed to Isaiah, Isaiah 7.14. We always see that on the Christmas cards and so forth. He would be born in Bethlehem in Micah 5.2. He would sojourn in Egypt in Hosea 11.1. 1. He would live in Galilee. In fact, he'd live in Nazareth in Isaiah. He would be announced in advance by an Elijah-type herald in Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3. In fact, the Old Testament closes with that specific promise. He would occasion the massacre of Bethlehem's children. That's mentioned in Genesis 35 and Jeremiah 31. And those are alluded... These are, Connections aren't contrived. They are documented in the New Testament as being fulfillments of those Old Testament pages. He would proclaim a jubilee to the world. His mission would include the Gentiles. Yes, that's all through the Old Testament. His ministry would be one of healing, Isaiah emphasizes. He would teach through the use of parables for a number of reasons. He would be disbelieved and rejected by the religious rulers of that period. He would make a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And he would be, be smitten like a shepherd as his sheep would be scattered. He would be given vinegar and gall. They would cast lots for his garments. His side would be pierced. Not yet, not a bone would be broken. That was specified in the requirements for the Passover in Exodus 12 and uh, in Numbers 9. And also is declared specifically messianically in Psalm 34. He would die among criminals. His dying words were foretold. He would be buried by a rich man. He would rise from the dead on the third day. That's in Genesis and the Psalms, in Jonah, Hosea, and elsewhere. And his resurrection would be followed by the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I said these Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek 270 B.C. They contain over 300 prophecies. We're going to go look at all 300 of them, right? No, relax. We're going to, what we are going to do, we're going to pick the eight simplest ones I could find. Just eight of them. But we're going to try to quantize as, uh, them as they go. We're going to look at eight of them. The first one is probably familiar to most of our ears. It's in Micah 5.2. You remember when the Magi came to Herod? Where is he to be? That's going to be born king of the Jews. And they, he had his scholars check. They dug up Micah 5.2. And they quote this verse as being prophetic of the Messiah. It says, But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. 
We could spend the evening on this verse. There are so many things hidden away in this verse that's amazing. Not just that he was born in Bethlehem, but that he preexisted from, from eternity past and much more. But the point is, all we want to extract here is the fact that the Messiah be born in Bethlehem. Now, I want you to stop and think about it. What's the probability of somebody being born in Bethlehem over the last 2,000 years? How can we approach that? Well, we can take a look at the world, and we can start zeroing in on that Middle East, Israel, Jerusalem. As we move into Jerusalem, we finally go south of Jerusalem. There's a place called Bethlehem, and this little town has a population of less than 7,000, pretty much unchanged through history. So what's the probability that somebody you ever might meet in the last 2,000 years was born in Bethlehem? Well, if we assume, we're going to use just round numbers and stay conservative. Let's assume that the population of Bethlehem is less than 10,000. That's a safe assumption. Let's assume that the average population at any point in time over the last 2,000 years is, is something in the nature of a billion, a billion people. So the probability of someone picked at random is roughly the ratio of 10,000 to, to 1 billion. Or, and the way you can deal with round numbers, the scientists and engineers typically just round them off in powers of 10. So we have 10 to the 4th divided by 10 to the 9th, or putting it another way, there's one chance in 10 uh, to the 5th, or uh, uh, one, one chance in 100,000 of meeting someone born in Bethlehem. How many of you have ever met someone born in Bethlehem? I see. We've got one, two, good for you. That, did, have you visited there? No. Been, since then, you've met them. That's unusual, okay. All I know is that you probably met more than 100,000 people in that sample, okay, total, in total number. But let's take a second one. This is a change of subject now. But it's another famous prophecy in Zechariah 9, verse 9, where the prophet says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly, riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Zechariah 9, 9. A famous verse, because Jesus deliberately fulfills this in the triumphal entry. And we'll be looking at that later. But the point is, how many people throughout history have presented themselves as a king to Jerusalem riding a donkey? Well, I have no idea, but if I said less than one in a hundred, am I being generous? I think so. Okay, so I'm going to use that as my plug figure. I'm going to suggest to you someone presenting himself as a king riding a donkey, uh, there's less than one in a hundred. All right? Now, let's go to the third one. There's another cute little phrase in Zechariah 11 where God says to Zechariah, I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Okay, and obviously most of you are aware of the fact that's the precise value that Jesus was betrayed for. Question, how many people throughout history have been betrayed for that precise figure, 30 pieces of silver? Well, I don't happen to know any, but if I say less than one in a thousand, are we together? If I look at all the ransom issues or places people have been betrayed and somehow lump them together, I'm going to suggest there's less than one in a thousand that had that specific price. Are we together? That makes sense? I'm being conservative, I think. Okay. The next verse adds some additional details. I'm going to treat it separately. The Lord said unto me, cast it to the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. This strange little verse here. And as you read that in the Old Testament, it might not come home. When you get to the New Testament, we'll refresh your memory of what happened after Judas betrayed Jesus. Then Judas, which betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. That's a remarkable statement because we know that by then Satan had entered Judas. So by Satan's own words, we declare Jesus' innocence. I think that's kind of a provocative thing. But let's go on. And the chief priest said, what's that to us? You see to that. In other words, a deal's a deal. It's a done deal as far as they're concerned. So he cast down the 30 pieces of silver in the temple, departed, and went out and hanged himself. This is all out of Matthew 27. So these, these 30 pieces of silver, where are they now? They're laying on the temple floor, right? Well, the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. There was a rule against that. It was unlawful for the priest to put in the treasury blood money. But you have to remember the chief priests had good CPAs. Okay? 
And they took counsel and, and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. In other words, what's lurking behind this is they couldn't take the cash and put it in the treasury. That was against the rules. But what they could do, they decided, was to use the cash to prepay some expenses. The temple was liable. If, some, if a stranger died in the precincts, they were liable to take care of the funeral and the arrangements. That was an expense of the temple. They had to find some place to bury him. Well, there happened to be a potter's field that was a bargain deal right now, so they took the cash, bought the potter's field, so they had a field where they could bury strangers in. They're prepaying anticipated expenses. So they took counsel, brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in, wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Well, let's go back to Zechariah 11, verse 13. Notice the details that are in this little verse. The price is 30 pieces of silver. Where does the transaction take place? In the house of the Lord, that is in the temple. Who ends up with the money? The guy that owns the field, the potter. Isn't that wild? What's the probability that that just happened by chance? That was random. If I say less than one, under, one in a hundred thousand, I could say one in a million and pull it off. Let's say a hundred thousand, let's be cautious, okay? Let's take the next one. This one has a lot of personal impact for me. I'll explain why in a minute. In Zechariah 13, verse 6, there's a strange verse. It says, One shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? And then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I can remember as a teenager coming across this verse, and in those days I was on kind of a kick to collect prophecy verses. So I'd, when I found a verse like this, I would type it up on a little card, the verse on one side and the reference on the other, and I'd add it to my collection to try to learn it. And I thought, wow, here's, you know, wounds in his hands and so forth. I thought, that, that's a prophecy of the Messiah. And so I added it to my collection. But as I tried to memorize it, I kept stumbling. It didn't make sense. The more I looked at it, the less sense it made. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? And then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Well, the more I thought about it, I had to admit to myself, that didn't fit the mental image I had. I can't visualize Jesus laying out his hands on these 12 by 12s or whatever they were, and them driving spikes into his hands, the Roman soldiers driving spikes into his hands as being wounded in the house of his friends. That just somehow, I had trouble with that. Until I was reading in John chapter 20, you may recall that first night after the Emmaus Road that evening, he appeared to the disciples after his resurrection, but Thomas wasn't with him, all right? The next day they saw Thomas and said, boy, you should have been at the prayer meeting last night. Guess who showed up? And Thomas expressed his famous doubt. He, he said unto them, I, Except I shall see his hands, in his hands the, nail, the print of his nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. See, Thomas was from Missouri, you know, he, as we would say in, in our provincial uh, format. And, uh, well, after eight days, again, the disciples were within, and Thomas this time was with him. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then he went over to Thomas. He said, Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach thither thy hand, and thrust it in my side, and be not faithless, but believing. That must have shook up Thomas to realize that Jesus heard every word he says. He, he, he hears every word you and I say, too. Thomas answered and said unto him, and I visualize Thomas falling on his knees when he says this. It doesn't say that. That's just my interpretation. Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Then I suddenly realized that verse in Zechariah 13, 6. What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. What wounded Jesus was not the nails. It was Thomas's unbelief. But let's get back to 13, 6. How many people take it at random? have been wounded in their hands in the house of their friends. Well, if I say less than one in a thousand, am I being generous? I think so. Let's take the next one, number six. In, we have to always pick at least one or a couple from Isaiah 53. God says to Isaiah, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He has brought as a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And of course, we're all, can't help but remark when we see Jesus in those six trials that occurred that night, three Jewish and three Roman trials, he made no defense. How many prisoners accused of a capital crime, in other words, death penalty, make no defense even though they're innocent? 
I suspect if you scan the records, you could probably find somewhere someone who was innocent that went to an execution without making defense. There probably have been, maybe, some in it. But if I say there's less than one in a thousand, are we together? I think I'm being generous. Okay. Let's take another one from Isaiah. A few verses later, Isaiah says, He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Strange apparent contradiction. His grave is with the wicked, and yet he's with the rich in his death. So the way I usually ask is, how many people have died among the wicked, yet were buried with the rich that were not attorneys? <laughs> and of course, I'm being flippant here. Seriously, how many people have died among the wicked and buried with the rich? Again, if I say less than one in a thousand, am I being generous? I think that, that the, the, the intrinsic paradox could be reflected in a higher number, but let's go on. Let's take just one more. And I'll reach it. We can't go through this without going to Psalm. Psalm 22 reads as if it was dictated first person singular as Jesus hung on the cross, even though it was written 800 years earlier. But one of the phrases there we'll pick up on, it says, For the dogs have compassed me, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now, what makes this remarkable, this was penned by David 700 years before crucifixion was invented. Remember that in, in Israel, the form of capital punishment was stoning. When they killed somebody for a crime or whatever, they stoned them. That was the official form of punishment. But here we have, in 700 years, before, crucifixion was invented by the Persians, about 90 BC. It was adopted heavily by the Romans, of course, and uh, so on. But it was invented by the, uh, by the Persians. But here, this was penned 700 years before the fact, and yet the whole psalm graphically portrays. In fact, there have been articles in the American Medical Association journals taken from Psalm 22 and, and analyzing the medical cause of death. It's, it's that detailed. But let's get back to this. How many people taken at random have died by having their hands and feet pierced? A lot of people probably have, but if I say less than 1 in 10,000, I think I'm being generous. Because there's so many people killed by so many other methods, I think I'm being generous. 1 in 10,000 being killed by a crucifixion-like method, I think that's fair. Okay, what I've done, I've, I've dragged you through eight of these. Born in Bethlehem, riding a donkey, uh, presenting himself king on a donkey for 30 pieces of silver. The transaction occurs in the temple, ends up with a potter and all that. There were wounds in the hands, his no defense, though innocent, died with the wicked, made his grave with the rich, crucified. Okay, we have these estimates, obviously just loose estimates, but we think cautious estimates. The question now is, what is the probability, given, let's assume for discussion purposes, these probabilities are conservative. In other words, they're, 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 the events are actually even more rare than this, but that's fine. What's the probability that a particular person fulfilled all eight of these. Well, to do this properly, we have to have a feeling for what's called composite probability. So indulge me a little bit further. Let's assume I have a room here of 100 people. And let's assume that 60% of the people in this room are male, and 40% of the people in this room are female. OK, and let's assume there's 100 of you. What's the probability that if I was blindfolded, and I somehow picked one of you at random, that I pick a female? Well, it's pretty obvious if I have 100 people, I've got 40 females, 60 males, and if they're, if they're uniformly mixed up and I touch one, the probability is 40% that I got a female. Are you with me so far? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let me take a different characteristic. Let's assume that I have in this population 60% of you are right-handed and 40% of you are left-handed. And let's also, for the purpose of the discussion, let's assume that those attributes are uniformly distributed. There isn't a tendency for men or women to be one or the other. Let's assume for this discussion that their, uni their attributes are uniformly distributed. So what's the probability if I blindfolded, touched one of you, got somebody that was left-handed? Again, it would be what? 40%. 40 of you are left-handed. 60 of you are right-handed. If you're mixed up uniformly, I touch one of you. There's a 40% chance. Okay, and the reason I'm building this, what I want to get to now is what's the probability of my touching somebody at random that's a left-handed female? Assuming I'm blindfolded and everybody's uniformly mixed up, whatever. Well, I take the one distribution, which is 40% left-handers. I take the other distribution, which is 40% females. And I put those two distributions together. And what I get, of course, the probability of left-handed female is 0.4, 40% times 40%, which is 
0.4 times 0.4 is 0.16. In other words, the way I get the composite estimate is to multiply the probability distributions. That's all I'm trying to point out. Now, those of you that are sophisticated, advanced statistics, say you should apply Bayes' theorem, which makes it just a little less, a little more rare. I'm going to spare you all that. This will be good enough for our purposes. Trust me. Okay. The, the probability is technically even a little smaller, but let's go on. Well, now I have these eight prophecies, born in Bethlehem, king of donkey, et cetera, et cetera, these eight prophecies. Since I've used powers of 10, it's easy to multiply them because all I have to do is count the zeros. This, in effect, the composite probability of, these eight, of one person fulfilling these eight prophecies is one chance in 10 to the 28th, 10 with 28 zeros after. That's a pretty big number. But if you're going to be precise, you say, by the way, you should divide that by the total population during the last 2,000 years, whatever. And I'm going to say, I'm just going to stipulate that let's just use 100 billion as a horseback estimate. Okay? So I divide the 1028 by 10 to the 11th, and you just divide by subtracting exponents. That's 10 to the 17th. Now, if I was in a statistics class here, the way you try to get a feeling for, say, one chance in 100, we typically take a bucket. And let's say we put 100 silver dollars in there. I take one of the silver dollars, and I mark it with someone's lipstick or... or nail polish or something, and put it in there, and we mix it all up. 99 unmarked ones, one mark. We mix it all up. The chance of my reaching in there and getting the one we marked is one chance in 100. That's a way of conveying what we mean by saying one in 100. Are you with me? Well, here I've got a situation where I've got 10 to the 17th. So what I need to do is get a bucket and put 10 to the 17th silver dollars in there. That turns out to be a pretty big bucket. In fact, I need a bucket that will have 10 to the 17 silver dollars, and what I need is the state of Texas. And I fill it with silver dollars, it will turn out to be two feet deep. 10 to the 17th is a big number. The chance of one person fulfilling those eight prophecies is equivalent to my marking one of those silver dollars in Texas two feet deep, mixing them up in such a way that it could be anywhere, reaching down blindfolded and picking up one and picking up the one that's marked is one chance in 10 to the 17th. That obviously is pretty unlikely. <laughs> but I've only used eight prophecies. I have 300 prophecies to choose from. So bear with me one more time. I have 300 to choose from. I've only used eight so far. I'm going to pick another eight. Now, if I literally did that, if I went through my list and picked another eight, it would be hard for me to find any that are as likely as the ones I've used. In other words, the more I reach in the list, the more technical they become, the more specific they become, therefore the more rare they are. Okay? But for this discussion, let's assume that the next eight are no less likely than the first eight I've used. That's a fiction, but it's against us, so to speak. You with me? They actually would be more rare, but that's okay. So, assuming there's no decrease in likelihoods, I have 10 to the 28th times 10 to the 28th, that's 10 to the 56th, but I've got to divide by the population again, 10 to the 11th. So now I have 10 to the 45th that I need to deal with. Okay, now I need a bucket that's going to carry 10 to the 45th, 10 with 45 zeros after it. That's a lot of silver dollars. You want to know how many silver dollars that really is? Well, it's 10 to the 45th silver dollars. If I take the earth and build a ball of silver dollars, that's 30 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. I will have 10 to the 45th silver dollars. Okay? Now, what I need to do is take one of those silver dollars, mark it with some whatever, and get someone to volunteer in a spacesuit, <laughs> and go wander around this ball of silver dollars in such a way there's an equal likelihood that the silver dollar could be anywhere, and he reaches in and picks one out. The chance that he picked the one we marked is one chance in 10 to the 45th. Does that seem a little unlikely? You betcha. Well, let's do it one more time, but instead of doubling, just to save time, let's triple it. We went from 8 to 16. Let's take 3 times 16, 48. We're going to take 48 prophecies. We have over 300 to choose from, so I haven't even scratched the surface here yet. And again, I'm going to indulge in this fiction that there's no decrease in likelihoods. I'm later going to show you a couple of these that are so bizarre, so precise, they alone, singularly, demonstrate the reality of Jesus Christ. But let's just stay with this model. I now have 
10 to the 28th multiplied by itself six times. That turns out to be 10 to the 168th, but I'm going to divide that by 10 to the 11th, the population, so I have 10 to the 157th. Now I've got to build a model for you and I to imagine that's really big, <laughs> really big. And silver dollars won't work because they're too big in the first place. So I've got to make a model consistent. The units I'm going to use are the smallest thing I can conceive of. What's the smallest thing you can imagine? An atom. Okay, good. I'm going to make a ball of every atom in our galaxy. Turns out that's about 10 to the 66th. That's been estimated. Um, I'm a long way from 10 to the 157th, so I'm going to make such a ball of every atom in the universe. I'm going to make such a ball for each atom in the universe. So now I've got 10 to the 66th times 10 to the 66th. That's 10 to the 132nd. I'm still a long way from my goal. So I'm going to repeat this mental exercise once every second since the universe began. And that's commonly accepted as 10 to the 17th seconds. Are you kidding? No. You take 10 to 15 billion, you know, take uh, uh, 15 billion years, run out the arithmetic, and you'll find out that's roughly 10 to the 17th seconds. So I'm going to make a ball of every atom in the universe for each atom in the universe. I'm going to do that little exercise once every second for the entire history of the universe. That brings me 10 to the 149th. I'm still a long way from trying to create a model for 10 to the 157th. I'm short by 100 million times short. Now I take an atom and mark it, and of course you follow the logic. And by the way, in this little exercise, we've only dealt with 48 out of 300 prophecies documented in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New. This is, of course, an excerpt from Hour 13 of Learning the Bible in 24 Hours. For those of you that uh, uh, have done that or are going into it, you'll recognize this being repeated in there. And in going through this list, by the way, I have not touched on the most amazing ones. The genealogy of Jesus Christ. We'll take a look at that next time, briefly. It contains some surprises that I think most people who read their Bible haven't discovered yet. We'll show you a few of those things. And we'll also explore a specific prediction. The angel Gabriel told Daniel five centuries in advance the exact day that their Messiah would ride that donkey into Jerusalem. And it's all in the Old Testament. We'll look at that. That one alone totally blows any attempt to mathematically predict its likelihood. We'll touch a little bit on the Midrashic prophecies before we're through. Because you see, this idea that prophecy is prediction and fulfillment, prediction and fulfillment, that's a, that's a Western model. The Apostle Paul was from the school of Gamaliel who was taught by Hillel and what they call the Midrash, that prophecy is pattern, not just prediction. And when we begin to understand the Bible in terms of its patterns, we get insights that are absolutely breathtaking that apply to us in our present day. We'll talk about that before the series is over. Well, what's our agenda? We've gone through this here a little bit. This first session has been an introduction. We've talked about the nature of time, that time itself is a physical property, that only God himself can transcend. And he alone knows the end from the beginning, and he lays that out in writing to prove that he is God and that he cares. We've also indulged in some speculations that have been borrowed heavily from the famous writings of Peter Stoner many years ago, this little model of the probabilities of the eight prophecies. It's not original, it's something we've adapted from, from some famous uh, work that's been done. But it gives us at least a grasp that the, the um, conjunction of these prophecies in a particular person go beyond any ability to attribute it to coincidence or chance or even contrivance. So that's the first session we've completed. Now, in our next session, we're going to talk about prophecy past. We'll look at other proofs of history, and it'll be startling to realize not only the Bible predicts the, the things that have happened throughout history, but the precision by which it does is absolutely breathtaking and missed by many scholars. In our third session, we'll talk about the end time scenario, prophecy of future. Everybody talks about the end times. We glibly throw words around, the tribulation and the antichrist and all that sort of thing. What are we talking about? We'll try to lay that out. Where do those ideas come from? What does the Bible really lay out? And where are some of the controversies that surround this? Because obviously good scholars have slightly different views of some of these things. And then the last session, after we've, we, we've seen the past, we've seen the future, 
The last session, we'll talk about prophecy present. What can we expect getting from here to the end times? If, if the end times are close, what should we see in the alignment of nations? What shall we see in our culture? What will we see in world events that will confirm or deny that we're, where we are on God's timeline? God has promised through Amos that God will do nothing but that which he has revealed through his servants, the prophets. It's all there if we have the diligence to look for it. Many will ask, okay, Chuck, what do I do next? One of the things that we offer is a product called Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. 24 one-hour sessions accompanied with 1,500 computer animated diagrams. That'll take you from Genesis to Revelation and you'll emerge from that with a strategic grasp of the whole Bible with an emphasis on its integrity as a whole. And you'll be able to navigate on any subject anywhere in the scripture. And uh, if, if you survive that ordeal, <laughs> then we also encourage you to take the Bible book by book. You pick the book. It almost doesn't matter where you want to start and take an expositional commentary and go through that particular book verse by verse with a competent commentary. And of course we offer them on audio tapes, also on CD-ROMs and MP3 and so on. Another way to go is topical briefings. We publish what we call briefing packages, two tapes plus notes on various topics. There's over 80 titles in the list, some of them on scientific issues, archaeological issues, doctrinal issues, whatever. And so. But there are other resources that, incidentally, are very, very inexpensive. We publish a monthly news journal called Personal Update. And your first year is free if you want to sign up. And it's our hope that after a year you'll get addicted to it. But we also have an internet site. It's one of the oldest, largest sites on the internet, www.khouse.org. Our ministry is called Koinonia House, but no one can pronounce it, let alone spell it. Everyone calls us K-House. So our phone number is 1-800-K-House-1. The website is www.khouse.org. On this website, in addition to a whole archive of messages and other things, we monitor 10 strategic trends every week. And we also publish a weekly newsletter that's free. If you, when you get on our website, just give us your email address, and you'll get every week, early part of the week, you'll get a summary of what's happened this past week that's biblically relevant in world affairs, in the scientific world, wherever. And it'll have a little summary and, the, and the, why it's biblically relevant. And then it'll link you. It'll show you the links of websites that follow that competently. And by the way, it's all free. You also, we also host the Blue Letter Bible, which is free. You have the English, Hebrew, Greek text. You can click on any verse and call up not just the verse in Hebrew, Greek, or English, but you can also call up as many as 50 different commentaries, classic or contemporary. There are commentaries, encyclopedias, Bible dictionaries. It's all word searchable. It's all free. Free anywhere in the world. And our major thrust is to encourage you to participate in home Bible studies. If you're not in one, we encourage you to explore the ones that are available in your neighborhood. And also, if there aren't, pray about leading one yourself. It sounds ambitious. It's not. It's very simple. We'll be glad to help you. We provide resources to help you do that. If you really want to grow quickly and learn and have a real fellowship experience, the home Bible study we found over the last 40 years to be the most fruitful place for personal growth. So we're Koinonia House, 1-800-K-House-1 is our phone number. We encourage you on your incredible adventure.